pleased to welcome Patterson Sims, Chief Curator of the Seattle Art Museum, to our podium. Over a year and a half ago, he came to the Northwest from the Whitney Museum of American Art in New York, where he was curator. His resume is littered with major exhibitions. For example, recent exhibitions in Seattle were Documents Northwest Series, C.T. Shu, and Made in New York, The New York School, 1945 to 1965. His talents don't stop there, though. Patterson is a prolific writer of articles, catalogs, catalogs and pamphlets, and he's a sought-after speaker by diverse groups. The New York School of Social Research and the Philadelphia Museum of Art the Japan Society of Art Critics to the Modern Art Group of London, from the Amarillo Art Center of Amarillo, Texas, to Carnegie Mellon University. Artists, collectors, and gallery owners respect him for his good eye, his dedication and commitment to know what's going on, which means seeing the work of and talking with working artists, and his eloquent analysis of the art scene. Portlanders are still talking about his provocative address at Artquake 88. Today we'll hear if any of his opinions have changed. How is art from the Northwest faring nationally? Last year he essentially said, you are what your address is. You have to go there, live and work there to gain national re acceptance and recognition. There, of course, being New York. Yet artists still choose to live here. And they choose to live here even though we lacked collectors, critics, and significant shows. What is this phenomenon? Some say it's the art community itself. It flourishes with a deep vitality and stimulating spirit through the interchange of ideas and self-criticism. What can a community like Portland do to keep its identity, maintain competitive standards, and become known as a place richly endowed with fine artists? How do we push the prospects for artists? How can we get the money to develop fellowships for artists, grants for critical writers, and create a network with collectors, curators, galleries, and national critics? This and more from our speaker. Please join me in welcoming Patterson Sims. Thank you very much from that uh, long introduction. I think the operative word you should all keep in mind is littered, as she discussed uh, exhibitions that I've organized. I think this is probably a perfect uh, verb to describe them. Um, I usually talk with slides, and so I feel as if I'm someone who has uh, broken their legs, maybe both of them, and has been denied my crutches. So you're just going to have to sort of bear with me, and you're going to get lots of exciting visual images at uh, Artquake. So just Imagine those images of Artquake are floating around this room to help me and help you as you get through these words. Um, I think really what I'm thinking about today in relation to some of the issues um, which have just been presented to you as, as key issues is really the conditions of culture. The conditions of culture. What makes culture happen? What makes people have a community that is considered a cultured community? Why is a community keep artists, how does it keep itself um, artistically and creatively alive? And so, needless to say, um, I turned to artists to help me in this, and so I interviewed uh, several people, several artists from the Seattle, from the group of artists that I, I encountered when I first came to Seattle, whose work I really most respected in the months that I first got there. I interviewed them and I had the following sort of reactions. Um, one had already moved to San Francisco, so uh, that became a long distance interview. Um, one, um, I was, uh, imp it was impossible to reach because he traveled so much uh, and never was in Seattle. Uh, another uh, was, um, because it was summer, was continually out on her boat. So that made the interview uh, very difficult. Final one was very busy, was able to grant me a few minutes of uh, his time because he was in the middle of packing to return to LA. Uh, so I was in a despair. I, I was, going to you know, borrow all my ideas from these brilliant people who I could say they really have the truth. They're the artists. They're the ones who can understand. So I finally turned to my most loquacious 
artist friend who really has lots of things to say and enormous numbers of complaints about why the Northwest art world is so terrible. And he continues, of course, to stay here. And uh, he went on and he gave me a litany of these complaints, most of which I've tried to synthesize and, and present in some semi-articulate fashion that isn't too insulting to myself as, as a member of this community and to all of you who care about this topic. Uh, and, but he ended his remark in a way that I think is, or his remarks in a way that I think is very telling. He said, but whatever I'm telling you, you know, all these things I'm telling you and all your own ideas and this conversation we're having about the conditions of culture and Northwest art and really what happens in this kind of a community, said, I know there's one thing, you'd never give that talk in Seattle. So I'm here in Portland to be able to give a talk I never could give in Seattle. I'd get in too much trouble. So I've gone um, a short distance, but enough of a distance, so that I can maybe speak my mind. Um, little did I realize that uh, so much of this sort of media stuff was going to go on, because I've probably just lost a job, and I'll be back here. You know? um, when I heard I was going to lecture here in August, I became very depressed because I thought, August? I mean, who would come to a talk in August? And all of you have shown up, and you've manifested again, I think, a central sort of uh, point that I have to keep reminding myself. I'm no longer in New York. I'm no longer in New York uh, in a situation where if I was giving a talk such as this, nobody would be there in August. They would have be gasping, making their way desperately to some other place, especially of all days on Friday afternoon. Um, so the conditions of culture really change from place to place. And one of the really conditioning factors for culture in this community is, of course, Mother Nature, is the thing that keeps you here in August when many other sensible people who live in urban areas have fled wherever that urban area is for some other place. You live in a place that most people prefer to vacation in. And um, I think that really is going to be an in initial stumbling block to the particular qualities that are needed to develop culture. Now, the conditions of culture require three entities, especially in, and I, I'm really addressing a lot of this to the visual arts, but I think it applies generally. That is artists. You've got to have artists in the community. You can have wonderful works of art, but if you don't have artists, if you don't have the sustaining creative figures, it's not going to work. To have those artists stay there, you need collectors and patrons or generous people who have enough, enough surplus revenue so they can part with it for art both to support it and to buy it in the most direct way. And then you need the third category, of which I consider myself a lowly member, the service people. Those people who really service the artists and, in many ways, the collectors as well. Service the people who run those cultural institutions by paying for them in so many ways and who are the, who one has to make a curious and, and sometimes very complex alliances with. The forces um, that uh, lie behind culture are, of course, the sort of grease of money, the grease of of support of, of various sorts. This is why one of the things that was just mentioned, individual supports to, uh, gr grants to artists are such a critical component in all of this because they are a little less tainted. Artists need places to show, and we need places to go to to look at what has been shown. We need more stuff from outside, and that's one of the critical factors that I find the Northwest suffers from, and it really surrounds the issue itself. The Northwest and Santa Fe are the two um, only genuinely remote areas in the United States. Every place else, even when it was thought it was a remote city, it's now become a hub city for that, for one or the other of the airlines. And so even the most obscure places now become hubs of something. Seattle and Portland and Santa Fe are not hubs of any place, and yet they both, or all three of these cities, want to keep a commitment to the arts, want to be involved in the sort of uh, center of uh, artistic life and, and of life itself, and yet they found themselves at a remove. What you need next, I would say, is um, a kind of critical mass of material, and that's something that cities like Portland and Seattle are beginning to assemble. They're beginning to assemble more art, more arts organizations, more artists, more collectors, more people, because the more people there are, one does not drive off the other. They really thrive on that kind of issue. I know in Seattle we have an issue, we have a problem where we've had one dominant collector of contemporary art for a long time, and she's a forceful, remarkable person. I remember having a conversation with her the other day, and she said, <laughs> it was just funny, but she said, I, I'm not a demanding person. I don't know why these people just are not doing something that I think they should do. And I said, well, you're very lucky. You don't have to demand very often. Each one of the communities, Portland, Seattle, 
Vancouver, um, Anchorage, all have one or at most two people who are sort of the top of the pile of those people at the town. And they're the ones who end up determining a lot of what happens with the cultural life of those cities. Those people need more competition. Those people need more independent individuals who say, you may be the dominant force here. You may be the collection, the art collection that everybody goes to see. But in point of fact, you don't have all the answers. And so I think you need a situation where you have enough critical mass where the sense of self-satisfaction really sort of closes off, that sense of the lionization of, of the locals, um, a sort of geographic myopia. At the moment in Seattle, we're having a big controversy about a really mediocre sculptor there named Richard Beyer, who has now 11 public sculptures in the community. And he's beloved in the community, I think, just by perhaps his own personal critical mass of sculptures. But the art, the art, um, <laughs> The Art Commission of Seattle has turned down putting uh, one of his sculptures in Green Lake, which is the most beloved of the numerous parks in the city, and it became front page news. I mean, the museum buys major paintings by Europeans, makes major acquisitions. It's buried. You can't even get somebody to discuss it. But if one modest sculpture is rejected in a city that already has 11, it becomes a controversy. I think we have to, in, in many ways, moving on from that issue, become a little less passive. I think this is a community um, that because of its extraordinary sort of physical allure, and I speak now of this, this community, Vancouver and Seattle, uh, makes people somehow passive to their visual environment. I think there's an extraordinary quantity of mediocre uh, architecture in both this city uh, and in, in Seattle. I think that's changed in the last three or four years. Some of the developers have become a little more conscious. Uh, mostly, I think, out of a sense of shame and embarrassment, as they realize that their colleagues around the country are making much better buildings in cities that are just the same size, so they really have to do as well. So that sense of competition has been key. It happened in Seattle with the so-called 1201 Washington Mutual Building, where finally a decent architect from outside was asked to come in and created uh, one of the best examples of that firm's work, which gets the, the city of Seattle constantly on the architecture pages of the New York Times because Paul Goldberger, their critic, is nuts about the building. And it's going to really help because the next building that John Runstead builds, Wright Runstead builds, they'll build with a, this same architect, in fact, because they realize quality pays. I think we've been in a situation where we've had a sense the quality doesn't pay or the quality is so much more expensive. In point of fact, in the end, it's much cheaper. Of course, so many of the issues we're talking about are this notion of, of location, of where we are. Seattle and Portland have their own kinds of sort of internal and external rivalries, just as Pullman, no doubt, and Bend have some, some sort of <laughs> peculiar uh, sense of uh, hostility and tension. And I think that kind of tension is very, very healthy, but at the same time, it's extremely counterproductive because the institutions have to work together and have to, in some way, develop the clout amongst themselves so that they can get the respect of certain of the larger big city institutions. Because I think uh, we really have to address the fact that, that culture is an enormously competitive um, area of our lives and that we are in constant competition with other cities who have made uh, the sense that, that culture is, who have, who have come to the conclusion that culture is a critical part. Now, this is hard for cities like Seattle and for Portland and for the people who live there because so many people move to these cities because of a kind of big city rejection, a kind of fear of metropolis. They wanted to get away from New York. At the moment in, in Seattle, in a kind of uh, journalistic um, epidemic, we're hearing again and again about this sort of California phobia. All these Southern Californians are coming to uh, Seattle just uh, laughing their heads off when they can see a, a, pain, uh, a um, house could cost $100,000 and quickly buying it. Um, and so we're suddenly discovering that these are cities which have enormous appeal to people from elsewhere, just as they really had appeal to many of us who've moved here in the last 15 years. That sense of isolation, that sense of a kind of calm, that sense of complacency are exactly the traits which are attracted us here. But curiously enough, they're not the, the, the traits that keep anybody any place. Um, they're exactly the traits that we have to, in many ways, reject. We have to sort of get over our fear of crowds, our fear of pressure, our fear of offense, our fear of people who are different. Those are qualities that I think drew people to communities like Portland and like Seattle. A kind of fear of people who are different, a fear of crowds, a fear of pressure, a fear of offense. Those are, I might um, say at this point, exactly uh, sort of the issues, especially fear of offense and fear of people who are different 
and fear of competition that are the driving forces of great art. Those are the things that make great art great. Those are the people who really come up with a slightly different vision of the world, which will become the vision which we're involved in. The moment in Washington, we're involved um, not in the state of Washington, but in, the, in Washington, D.C., uh, but nationally, of course, we're involved in a huge controversy about um, a group of six or seven photographs by an artist named Robert Maplethorpe and one photograph by a man named Serrano. These are photographs which have clearly a, a capacity to offend, but at the same time, they're part of much larger uh, bodies of work of these artists. They're, far, they're part of much larger exhibitions that both of these artists' works were included, which um, are not offensive in any way. And so somehow we've, we've, we've kind of fastened upon small particles of offense and forgotten an overall vision which is not offensive, um, which is not, not really very different than a lot of other art, just one small aspect of it. And I think that fear of difference, that fear of offense, is one of the um, hallmarks, of course, of a provincial attitude, of a community that really can't see beyond itself in some way. Now, I think what happens in a community like that is the artists who move there, in many ways, deal with art as the kind of ultimate hobby they see it as a kind of form of sort of mind hiking, if you will, or studio skydiving, or, or kind of um, sort of craft kayaking. I don't know what you'd say, but, <laughs> but they see it as, as something that um, they can do in the community. They can kind of fit in in the community. They can do it with a, a real sense that whatever they do um, will be mildly respected, um, but at the same time, uh, if they don't really draw too much attraction to themselves. The prime example of that in Seattle is the remarkable art artist Jacob Lawrence, who's lived there now for 18 years, um, who continually, he and Gwen talk about when they're going to move back to New York City, never seem to do very much about it, and whose art, of course, is seen as the very pinnacle of Northwest art. As an art artist, we can all feel very proud of living in the same area where they live, and his work has nothing, nothing to do with the Northwest. It's as if he never left his studio in Manhattan in a certain way. I think he's a, a, an exemplar of a certain kind of artist who can feel uh, an extraordinary degree of social uh, self-sufficiency, a kind of absolute social uh, self-sufficiency. I think this is a climate that really pushes uh, those artists who are the solo acts, those artists who really work quite independent of everyone else. One thinks of Robert Helm, who's a wonderful artist who works up in Pullman. Uh, one thinks of, uh, obviously, Jacob Lawrence. One can also consider, in that context, um, other artists, like an artist like Gary Hill, who's probably the best, internationally the most celebrated younger artist uh, who comes from Seattle and who hasn't been heard of by anybody in Seattle, and I doubt anybody in this room, but he's just been commissioned by Bo Borg to, uh, to uh, make a film for a special festival of, of uh, his work that will be done in Paris at the, at the Museum of Modern Art in the middle of Paris. He's just come back from Japan where he was the honored guest of the Japanese government because of his videos. He's unknown. He's, he's the prime example of this sense of coming to the community because of a sense of solitude, a kind of diminution of the lack of obvious competition within one, one's own community. And what that generates, of course, is, is a lack of community. Artists who work in such isolated ways, they don't work together, and they don't develop that kind of nexus of artistic interactions which cause great art to occur, cause a kind of cross-fertilization of ideas, where um, a visual artist from the community is making a set for the ballet where uh, the opera company is coming to the museum and saying, um, what, what artist would be appropriate to do this? Or can we jointly bring a, a composer into this community or support a composer who was right here? Each artist really ends up talking about all the other artists and fantasizing about success and not really getting themselves motivated about what ideas might motivate their work as opposed to how they might become successful. Now these are syndromes which are not unfamiliar to anybody who's lived in New York City. They're universal syndromes. All of us, I think, get much more caught up in success and how we attain that success than actually doing the job we're supposed to do and kind of getting on with it in a certain way. But it makes uh, for the conversations um, to become really conversations about who's selling what, um, who's involved with whom, and not so much what ideas might actually underlie. And so that on the occasional situations in which one has conversations about art in some sort of capped letters, um, I find that you leave those conversations in Seattle often feeling as if you've had a kind of epiphany, because they're so rare. 
because they're just not conversations that would happen. It's a little embarrassing to get that involved with art. I mean, get involved with whether Mount Rainier is visible that day or not. Don't really worry too much about whether simulation or replication or, or so many of the ideas which are, are absolutely on the tip of everyone's tongue in other communities are significant or not. I think what happens is artists in, in these various communities kind of put on sort of Seattle glasses or Portland glasses, and they only really see what's here. And they're, they're kind of the, the, the sort of fancy dark glasses that I remember thinking were really cool to buy when I was younger where the reflection would be out, where, where the person would see themselves who you were looking at. Well, these, these are some perverse version of those where the reflection is all inside. It's as if they put, the, they put that shiny, they put that shiny um, glass that was on the outside of the glasses. By mistake, they put it inside. And people get quite hung up on it. I think there are ways of, of getting around that. Vancouver at the moment is, is in the midst of this... Um, of this utter change as a result of people in Hong Kong deciding that's the, the place of choice for second homes. And so as a result, the city has to really change its focus on the world. And it's that change in focus which I think is going to be critical. Because at the moment we're living in, no matter whether you live in Portland or, or um, in um, Beijing, it's a totally global world. I mean, one of the most telling parts of the issues uh, of the uh, crisis um, in, in Peking or in Beijing was, was the communication by fax, the sense that there were Chinese students in America who just used fax constantly to get information back and forth. It becomes impossible to be isolated at this point. It becomes impossible to have a sense of being able to um, somehow isolate and, and, and locate yourself in some uh, sort of situation of solitude. Now, uh, another sort of S word, as it were, is the word of style. This is a word that I found myself using the other day when we were having a meeting about sort of marketing the Seattle Art Museum and figuring out what would happen to the Seattle Art Museum when it moved out of its lovely green enclave in a volunteer park down to the middle of the city, a couple of blocks from the, from the uh, market and was in the middle of a kind of an urban center as opposed to something more pastoral, albeit 11 and a half minutes away from the urban center, but still considered a kind of suburban place. And I brought up one of the words that I felt that I wanted the experience of the museum to project to visitors who came there. I said I wanted the museum to be stylish. You would have thought um, I had used a word like fascist. I mean, they were so upset <laughs> at the idea of style. And I think um, we're both... Um, Cities that have a tremendous fear of style, a tremendous fear of someone having a kind of edge, a kind of sense of difference, a, a, a kind of quality of rising above the norm, of behaving in a slightly different way. I think it's fascinating that, that, a, that a, a company like Nordstrom's really passes for being chic. And it isn't chic, Nordstrom. It's really a wonderful place. It has extraordinary service. It has all this litany of things that we find every uh, institution. I was talking to a banker who was on the board of the uh, Seattle Art Museum uh, the other day, and he said, what we've really discovered in our whole marketing initiative is that we want to be like Nordstrom's. Well, I mean, uh, the world has sort of turned itself sort of upside down. It is, of course, very hard to criticize phenomenal success, but I think that success is really, um, that, that success is really key to uh, an issue. And the issue is that style is something we're supposed to be scared of. That style, a kind of edge, is something that we're supposed to sort of distance ourselves from. Well, of course we're going to have trouble with art. Because art is about, to some degree, style. A sense of setting oneself off, setting one's visions off. What's interesting to me is that Bloomingdale's, which is the sort of, if you will, Nordstrom's of New York, um, <laughs> Bloomingdale's is the constant butt of jokes for people who live in New York. They're always putting... Uh, down Bloomingdale's sort of sense of, of itself as this kind of style leader. Um, and there, there isn't really a particular reverence that surrounds it. And I think that reverence is one of the things that is both quite lovely and quaint about uh, cities like Seattle and maybe even more Portland, but is also and finally a little despicable. Because if one is going to uh, get involved with having a city that has a dynamic, you have to accept new ideas. You have to accept those new ideas, annex those new, new ideas, take what's good, and if it doesn't work, throw it out. Um, I think in New York City, and this is uh, taking my uh, Nordstrom's and Bloomingdale's analogy a little further, if you owned the same coat for six years, you would be embarrassed. If you owned the same coat in Seattle or Portland for six years, you'd just take it back to Nordstrom's. <laughs> and so I think there is a big difference between the two cities. Now, in, in Seattle, as you have here, um, we have lots of smaller arts organizations. We have one called COCA, 
911, the Henry Art Gallery. And what I discover is so fascinating is the, the cultural institutions sort of for a long time uh, wanted to feud with each other, wanted to in some, in some sense pretend, pretend they were great enemies of each other. They didn't work together. You had a little of this problem with uh, P PCVA, one of the most remarkable institutions for contemporary art that was in this country in the last uh, 20 years, which you lost because you simply wouldn't support it. And um, in doing so, I think uh, in a peculiar way, and that's what's so fascinating about these issues, you lost respect, probably more respect outside of the city than you did in the city. The director of the Seattle Art Museum is fond of saying that the Seattle Art Museum is better known in Tokyo than it, than it is in Tukwila. Now, Tukwila I don't know whether you know where that is. It's a little town not far from Seattle. But in a peculiar way, the Seattle Art Museum, with its great Asian collections, is far better known in Japan than it is in the state of Washington. Because in a peculiar way, these kinds of institutions have reputations that exist outside of the institution. They're the thing that is different, distinctive. They're the thing that carries the message from outside inside and carries what's inside outside. And so when you lose an organization like PCVA, or when we are on the verge of perhaps losing an organization like COCA in Seattle because nobody can quite get it together to give them the support because they do problematic and difficult shows, we all lose a great deal because we lose a sense of the cultural dynamic of that city. We have in Seattle, and I think this happens as well in this community, a kind of obsession with the local. As I said, the sort of lionization of the locals. In, in Seattle, it's an obsession with what's called the Northwest School. The Northwest School, when you finally sort of quiz these people what it is, because I sort of thought the Northwest School was art that was made in the Northwest, and art is still being made in the Northwest, so it still must be going on. Well, no. The Northwest School was the work that made, was made by Morris Graves and Mark Toby when they lived in Seattle several decades ago. And it's dealt with as if it was just being made, as if it was the only art of any real lasting significance. And it works to a tremendous detriment to the artists who are trying to work and live there right now. Because of people in Seattle, and this is, again, not unlike what would happen in other communities, but we're really trying to do a self-critique here that's, uh, that's um, specialized. People in Seattle would much prefer to buy a third-rate print by Mark Toby than a first-rate work by a younger artist. And it's a tragedy, because they're getting something that is utterly mediocre by an artist who is a, a good artist, maybe even a great artist, as opposed to getting something that is really, truly excellent by someone who has a potential for being a great artist, or certainly a good artist. And so these are um, situations where we begin to um, to really lionize local figures. What's ir ironic, at least in Seattle, and I think this really carries over to this community as well, is that Morris Graves and Mark Toby were distinctly national and international personalities. They saw the world in, in utterly global terms. Toby's work was, of course, as respected, as respected in Japan as it was in, ba in Tokyo, as it was in Basel, Switzerland. He had an international view towards the world. And so this very person who really was manifesting his international view is now used to make an extraordinarily distinctively and, and small sort of provincial view. So let me just sort of move on to sort of some, some specific examples of Seattle artists who I think are doing quite remarkable work. An artist like Dale Chihuly, who's the kind of quintessential Northwest artist in a way, because he was born in Tacoma. He has come back, has started one of the great centers for um, artistic creativity in a medium, the Pilchuck School in Stanwood, uh, Washington. And he um, is really, in many ways, the dean of Northwest artists, who's made the longest and most sustained commitment. The Seattle Art Museum has only paid attention to his work once in the 20 years of his career. I just organized this, the second exhibition that the Seattle Art Museum has ever done of glass, um, of the medium of glass. It's the, arguably the only medium which has international attention that comes from Seattle and from the whole Northwest. Artists from Czechoslovakia, from Japan, from Finland flood a, a small town, a small place, 45 minutes to an hour north of Seattle. Nobody comes from Czechoslovakia to, um, uh, no, no Czechoslovakian artists come to Portland or Seattle who aren't connected with this remarkable place. And yet, in a peculiar way, we perversely turn our back against it. Another artist like Buster Simpson, a kind of wonderful street artist who's evolved into now, now being a nationally known public artist who made all the sort of impromptu benches along First Avenue in Seattle and who's now working in a variety of other cities. Or Jeff Wall, a fantastic artist who lives in Vancouver, who's better known in Germany and whose works achieve higher prices in Germany than they do in Canada 
or, for that matter, in America. Or the artist Gary, uh, Gary Hill, who I mentioned to you earlier, who's internationally celebrated as one of the five or ten best video artists, most cutting-edge video, art, video artists working uh, in the world today. Lives in Seattle in a small little house, uh, <laughs> utterly unpretentiously, totally unknown. Um, and I think it reminds us of this whole issue, that there are remarkable artists here. Robert Helm is another example. I'm sure there are artists like that in, in, in Portland, and I, if I was uh, being more tactful, I'd be mentioning their names right now. They don't come to my mind, uh, and I apologize. And Elizabeth and, and some of the other people here, who, and Ed Godoro and Selena, who know the scene here very, very well, will quickly be calling their names out to me afterwards and criticizing me. But I think there's a, a sense that um, we have a peculiar and perverse kind of boosterism. We sort of forget the very best things that are in the community and remember some of the more mediocre things in the community. I remember having a huge argument with um, my friends here uh, about the Raymond Caskey sculpture, which probably is your best known public sculpture. This is the one, of course, that adorns the Portland building, the Portlandia figure. I find it an utterly mediocre sculpture. It's enormously well suited to its site, but Raymond Caskey isn't going to cause anybody, anybody's heart to beat any faster, um, ever. Um, but Raymond Caskey does a job. Now, art is supposed to do a job. Art has to do a job before it does some of the other things, and it does the job. But it's not an inspiring symbol of the city, I don't believe. It's not something that says, this was a building that was built in the 70s, except in the 1870s. So um, I think we have an issue here where we have to sort of get beyond boosterism, or if we're gonna, if we're gonna have a kind of attitude of boosterism, we better boost the right things. Boost the artists who really are making the statements that are on the cutting edge. The artists who your children and grandchildren will remember, not the people who uh, will sink into that sort of slough of uh, the second rate, which um, is an infor an, an unfortunately the fate of all curators and uh, most artists. Now, I think uh, what's happened in both of our communities, and I'm, I'm going to close this down so I can be grilled, um, what, what's happened in all of our communities is that we really, or both of our communities, in Vancouver as well, is that we really see art as a kind of public amenity. The Seattle Art Museum was enormously successful in raising an, an fantastic amounts of money for its new building and getting a bond issue rather shrewdly passed um, to pay for half that building by really the notion that Seattle is a big museum. Uh, is a, Seattle is a big city. Big cities have certain factors involved in them. A museum is one of those factors. Not that art is interesting, not that art is something that people would actually like, but that art is something that's supposed to be there in a community that's a big community. And so in a certain sense, we kind of twist and turn around the whole reason why the cultural institutions exist. Um, and I think we begin to see cultural institutions um, as a kind of a, cultural checklist, if you will, of things that you have to have in a community. I think it's more than that. I think there has to be a vision uh, that makes people realize that it might be as important to go to the museum as it is to take a hike, uh, that it might be as significant to visit the museum. What we found when we had a focus group at the Seattle Art Museum uh, not long ago was that um, was that many people um, had been to the museum once. They sort of felt as if it was, again, a kind of on some lifetime checklist. They went to the Seattle Art Museum. Well, now, nobody um, really, assuming you get into it, goes to, um, goes to the, the, to the uh, Tacoma Dome, or um, I'm now blanking out the sports stadium in, Se in Seattle. Help me. Kingdom. The King Kingdom. You see, you see how far out of it I'm. I've never been to the Kingdom. I know it's there. I think it's wonderful, but I've never been there. But uh, nobody goes to the Kingdom once, basically. And one of the things that was so frustrating to me about this focus group was they interviewed people about the museum, who of course feel a sense of remove from the museum. But it'd be sort of like interviewing me about the Sonics. I mean it would be one of the most depressing interviews that somebody who was involved with the Sonics could ever have. Because A, I would go, what are the Sonics? And then, you know, when, as I, I've done that before with other teams in Seattle, but then um, I would um, say, oh yes, I'd love to go to a basketball game once, you know. But the point is that we all do have our own cultural and sort of sociological and life niches that we fit into. But basically, an art museum can be the kind of substance, and I hope it will take its clues, not from Nordstrom's, 
but from the market in Seattle, a place where people need, they feel to go on a reg feel they need to go on a regular basis. They go there for sustenance. They go for the they go there for the best that the region offers in every sense of the word. They take their friends, their relatives there from someplace else. They marvel at the view, the surround, what's there, and then what's at the market. They marvel at how many people came there. They get annoyed and they get uh, angry that there's so many people there, but they're extremely proud that this place has that kind of magnetizing area. So I would hope that the Seattle Art Museum, as we really face the, um, its, its future downtown, will be like a, a market in some way and will be a place where people will feel they need to go on a regular basis, not a kind of a one lifetime experience, but an ongoing experience. You do something here in Seattle that I'd like to, I mean in Portland, that I'd like to kind of close by talking about for a second, that's the Artquake. It opens on Thursday, um, August 31st, very, very soon. My old friend and, and your uh, remarkable former citizen, Mary Beebe, is the juror this year. Mary, who was um, such a dynamic uh, leader of the Portland Center for the Visual Arts and now has gone down to San Diego. She'll speak um, on the Stewart Collection, this remarkable collection of public art that she's that she has put together um, in the Wing and Strad Theater at 6.30 on the 31st, and then at 7.30 um, there'll be a preview of Artquake. I bring this up and I do this little plug for Artquake because art is kept alive by people having dynamic experiences with art. Art is not kept alive by watching a rerun on TV of a movie about Vincent van Gogh or hearing that uh, the latest um, auction in New York, uh, a Pontormo sold for 35 million, or that um, your um, niece or nephew are going to art school. Art is kept alive by looking at art, and art is kept alive by supporting artists. And that's what you really, you must do, I must do, we all must do, if we want to change the conditions of culture in this community and in Seattle as well. Thank you for your attention. It's now time for questions from City Club members. The microphones are being brought to the center of the room. Uh, there are also cards on the table for those of you who would like to write your question. After you write it, please hold it up so staff members can come get it and bring it up to the podium. Uh, I will remind you, though, that questions from the floor are given preference uh, over written questions. Today, our board host, James Harris, has the pleasure of the first question. James. Thank you, Mary. Mr. Sims, for a moment, can we move past Vancouver, Seattle, Pullman, and Bend, even Santa Fe, and can we look at a, a national question? With John Fronmeyer now going to the National Endowment, what advice would you give him concerning the Helms Amendment? And does Helms know that how to keep our art alive? Uh, when that announcement was made public, um, or at least when I learned about it through the New York Times, um, I immediately called my friend uh, Selena Autumn and said, tell me about this guy. And uh, literally, as I was on the phone calling him, uh, a former colleague of mine from the Whitney Museum, Susan Lebowski, who now runs the visual arts programs for the NEA, was calling me and saying, tell me about this guy. <laughs> um, so he's an unknown, obviously, for everyone, except for some of the people in this room who actually know this man. It'll be very hard to know how he's going to react. He's been very politic thus far. There hasn't been a murmur out of him. I think it's probably a very sage way to advance, uh, at least to get the job, um, to find out what he will do with it. But at the same time, he's going to have to have something that he may or may not be lacking, um, but his silence is, is uh, a little alarming on that level, moral courage. He's going to have to stand by his convictions. The, pr the procedures that were adapted by the NEA are very logical procedures, the, the peer review. It's done in every area of our government, science, business questions, every area of our, of our government, decisions are made about how money is allocated that come from peer review. Once you deny the appropriateness of peer review in one area, it'll be denied in every other area. So for those of you who think you're somehow removed from what's going on at the NEA, 
um, or that it won't affect the actual workings of your life, you're really wrong. Because once peer review is questioned, a whole procedure for how we make decisions is, is a question. Peer review obviously um, materialized as a system for making decisions because we couldn't really trust individuals to make those decisions. We knew they were in different ways biased. As biased um, in their own way, obviously, as Jesse Helms is in his, wanting in some way to make a name through what is, I think, an extraordinarily modest issue. There have been 80,000 grants in all that have been given through the NEA of big and small amounts. Um, those grants are, are made to every number of projects. Proje uh, some controversy has uh, occurred about some of those projects, but nothing like this controversy. And it, it, it really is an issue where uh, the sheer demographics of it indicate that there isn't a problem, that the problem is um, really in the, in the minds of a few people. One of the things that, that lies behind the issue that fascinates me is the notion that art can somehow behavior modify. That someone could look at a Robert Maplethorpe photograph and shift their sexuality or something or immediately attack some unfortunate person walking down the street. Life doesn't work that way. I mean, art doesn't have that power in our lives. I wish it did, um, not in the particular case of Maplethorpe perhaps, but that would be, should be left up to individuals. In the Serrano photograph, it's no, no question about it. It, it has the, the possibility of offending the immersion of a crucifix inside um, what the artist tells us is urine, yellow liquid, for all we can tell from the photograph. Um, in any event, that is clearly a, an offensive issue. But if we have separation of church and state, which it seems to me from the very infancy of my learning about this system uh, we've had, then it really isn't a consideration that should enter into this discussion. If there's a separation of those issues, we have to separate those issues. If Jesse Helm chooses not to as an individual, that's fine. But again, when he inflicts his ideas on a whole system of doing things. And uh, as you all know from going to exhibits with any regularity, the NEA is central to the wide number of exhibitions and projects that you will see in museums and other situations that have to do with the visual arts. And uh, to cut that all out because one man was offended by seven photographs seems to me to be, um, or to question that whole system, seems to me to be very, very short-sighted thinking. So I would ask for him to have moral courage. In the best of worlds, he'd find out something truly despicable about Jesse Holmes and shut him up. Because a lot of this problem has to do with one individual making a lot of trouble. And maybe that individual has an absolutely perfect and Im impeccable moral life. But I think he's probably like most of us. There's something that we're a little bit unhappy about that we did at some point in our lives. There's some part of our character or part of our thoughts that might be just a fraction off of the norm. And at that moment, we have to begin to say, I have compassion for someone who is operating slightly off the norm. Robert Maplethorpe's photographs are mostly so tasteful, so stylish, so elegant to be utterly boring. I think Robert realized at a certain moment in his life that he was, if he was ever going to name, make a name for himself as a photographer, he'd have to develop some kind of edge in his art. And he found it. He looked to his own life which was unquestionably unconventional, his life. But he was very upfront about that. There were no lies in his work. And reminding us not to lie, of course, might be uh, one of the premises that art is built on. Reminding us to try to be honest about ourselves and the full range of our being might be very important for us. Um, I think Robert is probably on some level thrilled that this happened, Maplethorpe, because he's been turned into a kind of cultural hero in some way. His work has had an effect way beyond the effect that art usually has. It's, be, it's really become, his name has become far more famous. The catalog is virtually sold out, so the Jesse Helms, Helms can be very thankful in many ways that he has uh, promulgated the sale and the interest in this artist's work way beyond what would have happened before. So uh, Jesse Helms maybe has his own kind of uh, just dessert in that he's made an artist who he finds despicable far more famous than he ever would have been. One other thought is that Richard Andrews, who lives in Seattle, who was the former head of visual arts, was saying the other night on a discussion of this topic that uh, from what he'd heard, and I don't know whether he was being whimsical or not, in the NEA panel reviews of projects, the people who were making those choices uh, acting, I think, in response to this issue, were giving a grant to every artist who depicted a naked person in their work. Now, whether this is the, tr the truth or not, I don't know, but I know on Monday I go for the first time in my life to be on an NEA panel in Washington. And I see as a professional uh, that 
that activity is enormously compromised. And I know that will impact on my thinking. In a way, the system has already been muddied as a result of this. Already our thought process has been changed because we've questioned one of the sort of basic structuring principles of how funding is done in this country. We've questioned peer review. And we've also done an extraordinarily, or, or Helms has suggested a ridiculous thing, which is that you would penalize an institution that it acted in utter accordance with the system. You would penalize them after the fact. Because if they changed the IRS law and started paying you, asking you to pay for all the IRS uh, bills you would have accrued under the new law. Think about that for a second. And think what that represents in terms of a policy once promulgated in all the areas of our life. Other questions or thoughts? Jesse Helms has silenced the group. <laughs> well, we have a written question. What constitutes a good national collection for a serious collector? individual or corporation, what's the best one you've seen and what's the best Northwest collection? Uh, there are lots of questions there and yes. I don't have as good a memory as I should. Um, <laughs> that's a funny little preface to this question. Um, what constitutes a good national collection? A good national collection is a collection like um, the remarkable Northwest collection that exists at the Portland Museum where people come to see that collection. It's known that it's here. It becomes a, an extraordinary repository where a, an area of cultural life has been explored in a very full way in a collection. Or the Asian collections of the Seattle Art Museum begun by the founder of the museum, Dr. Fuller, and his mother in 1933 and continued with great enthusiasm over it. So that this is a collection which is built on itself and becomes a kind of national uh, resource. Now, what constitutes a, a serious collection for, say, a fledgling collector is to focus in on what he or she really likes, not to buy one of each, to make a decision about how you're going to proceed and to be as specific as possible in the way that you proceed. Because at this point, the issue of money becomes, um, it rears its head very, very quickly into any discussion about what people will collect. And so you make a decision to collect um, drawings and sketches for public art. You decide to collect um, photography made by women in the 1920s in Europe. You decide that you want to get uh, very involved in uh, Mexican folk art. And so you decide an area and you collect it with brilliance and with a kind of uh, pre precision. The best, um, nor the Northwest's best public collections probably are in Seattle, but they're extraordinary painting collections here in Portland at your museum. You have really fantastic things, um, things of, of great, great strength, and they've recently been and, and wonderfully reinstalled at the Portland Museum. Um, so that, those are some of the better public collections, and that's not a revelation. Some of the best private collections, curiously, you have in Portland two of the best private collections in their area that exist nationally. A wonderful, distinctive collection of very contemporary art uh, by a collector who has insistently tried to uh, assess the important work made in the last 10 minutes, mostly in New York, and done a, a fiendishly good job for two or three generations of artists now. And you have uh, one of the best Asian collections, private Asian collections, that exists um, in America. Utterly uncelebrated utterly superb and fantastic in this community. I think uh, maybe collectors do very much um, what certain artists have done. They become um, sort of figures of solitude. Since they have no one to talk to, no one appreciates them, or their friends and colleagues from other areas of their life give them nothing but grief for the works they collect, they really withdraw into themselves. And so that has happened in your city, and you have some two phenomenal collections here, uh, which the individuals have withdrawn in a, in a tragic way. Um, and I think the best collections that I see, as I say, are the most focused. The corporate collections have become the most significant collecting force in Seattle, for instance. There's, many more, uh, there's much more activity for corporate collecting than there is for, um, in private collecting in Seattle. And that's both good and bad. Bad because the taste uh, gets watered down in the uh, choice of works of art. That very seldom do the corporations really turn to an expert and let him or her pick the collection or use the expertise of an individual. And very seldom do they let the collection have the focus that it should if it's going to be considered a great collection. Also, one of the tendencies of Northwest co corporate collections is to become obsessed with having Northwest art. This kind of false boosterism that I discussed otherwise. So other questions or thoughts? Yes, my name is Amy Richter. I'm chair of the Arts and Culture Standing Committee. And I have two questions for you, and they're totally unrelated. But I thought, since there do doesn't seem to be too many other people here asking questions, I'd go ahead. First of all, though, I would like to thank you for coming. I really enjoyed your speech and 
did sort of leave me somewhat speechless. Uh, getting back to Mr. Fronmeyer, do you think his elevation to that position at the NEA will have some impact on the isolation of the Northwest that, that you described? And if so, what that impact would be? And then the second question has to relate more to you as a, the curator of a, a museum, and that is what you perceive your role is in terms of developing and encouraging the local artists. In the case of, of the recent appointment of the NEA of you know, a lawyer from Portland, I think it will be of great help um, to the Northwest. But I don't know if it can be of specific help. I think we're, the government and government activity is so, is so um, scrutinized at this point that uh, it would be very foolish, and it may actually work against this area somewhat, if too many grants came from the NEA to the Northwest, or if suddenly any blip in the number of grants occurred for the Northwest. I would even suspect that uh, what will happen is it'll go down ever so slightly because there's such an extraordinary sensitivity about issues about whether there's been any abuse of political position or political power. I think on a personal level, uh, he obviously cares about this area. He will come back to this area. He's, uh, he will be enormously enriched by that experience, hopefully not financially, um, or he could get himself in a lot of trouble. Um, but he'll be enriched in terms of his experience, and he'll bring a sense of sophistication to the processes of uh, funding for culture and for the arts in Portland, which will be of great benefit to you. But um, I think symbolically it represents that the Northwest um, is, has, has captured people's attention for one reason or another. I mean, getting being now an inveterate sub subscriber to the New York Times and reading the New York Times far more avidly than I ever did when I lived in New York, the incidence of mention of Seattle is just fantastic. It's extraordinary. It just gets mentioned so many times. The cuisine of Seattle, the architecture of Seattle, the great outdoors, which you would have expected. But other things are getting mentioned. And so this part of the country is maybe getting the attention which sort of moves around the country. Um, very soon, no doubt, they'll be, fam they'll be filming a major, um, a major TV sitcom uh, in one of our cities. And uh, I'm looking forward to seeing the sort of uh, Portland equivalent of Dallas. Um, <laughs> any event, the role of the curator. I think the curator really has to be as supportive as they can to the artists who live in the community. Because I said the artists are the sort of core of what's healthy about the community. When the artists abandon a community, it's a disaster, um, at least in New York, and I think to a certain degree elsewhere. They set the tone in many areas, including real estate. They usually are the people who assess the changes and shifts in real estate faster than most real estate agents do. They sense what area will be an attractive or interesting area to live in. So they have this a peculiar capacity to wash over so many areas of a city, not just the art that they're supposedly involved in making and involved in, in, in defining themselves as professionally, but any number of areas within the city, so that one has to be as supportive as possible. One also has to be as honest as possible. I mean, you have to come and be honest about what you think the work is, what, it, what its strengths are and what its deficiencies are. If it has strengths, you have to do everything in your power to uh, help that individual make that point of view and their work well known. In, the, in that community, by encouraging collectors to buy it, dealers to represent it, uh, corporations to uh, support it, and nationally, sending slides off to other people. It's a frustrating role because there are an awful lot of artists, and a lot of those artists who are closer to where the main marketplaces of art are, are going to have a better opportunity to have their art uh, get some attention paid. But I think one has an extraordinary role to assist artists if you can. I believe very strongly in assisting collectors to the best of my ability. Um, I'm sure there are people who would find that questionable to, but if I see a wonderful work of art that I think is terrific, I'll always tell collectors in the community about it. I'll encourage them. I'll do everything in my power to get them to buy it. An example of this is not long ago, um, one of the three or four really interesting and main collectors of contemporary art in um, Seattle and I were talking and he was saying that how much he really liked a particular sculpture he owned, which was promised to the museum and with the death of a friend, he wanted to give that sculpture in a yeah, friend's honor to the museum and I was very touched by that. And I said, Would you, are you interested in sculpture? He said, very interested in sculpture. If you find something, let me know. And so I'd happened to see something and I thought, well, should I pester him about it? Well, I let him know and it was a wonderful sculpture by a turn of the century French artist named Bordel, and lo and behold, he bought it in auction, and it came to Seattle. And I was very pleased, because it's wonderful when you think something you've suggested to somebody actually paid off, and it ha they did something. But the point of it was, for me, a much bigger issue. With the coming of that Bordel sculpture to Seattle, it increased by one-third the number of 19th century sculptures in Seattle. We are in such utterly impoverished areas in terms of artistic activity. There's so little art here. There's more art 
on Park Avenue in New York in, co in private collections than there is in Seattle and, and Portland combined. If you want, if you made them, I always wanted in, when I lived in New York to make the Museum of Park Avenue. Just somehow take some fabulous magnetic uh, device and, and pull from all of those apartments all of the art that was there from Park Avenue from 59th Street to 86th Street. And you'd have a far better museum than we could manage if we pooled the Seattle Art Museum and the Portland Art Museum. There just simply isn't so little art here. So that every work of art you bring into this community becomes a significant link to the outside world, a significant link reminding us that we are global people, that we're surrounded by issues and uh, agendas that have to be perceived of as global if we're going to stay alive. And so uh, everything I can do to encourage works of art to enter into the community I will do. Even more sometimes than monolithic buildings. I think sometimes uh, communities and, and the individuals who run institutions have a kind of complex about buildings. Um, even more than buildings, we need things to put inside them. Other questions or thoughts? This will have to be our remember. last question. I don't uh, want to get you in trouble in the state of Washington any more than we want to get John Fronmeyer in trouble in Washington, D.C. I'm sure he'll be above reproach, and I'm sure you are too. I want you, however, to comment on uh, in the area of politicizing or putting pacemaking in the political arena, uh, can you comment about the murals at your state capitol in Olympia and the hubbub about that? One of the interesting things about the murals, and it's very uh, related to the Maplethorpe and Serrano issue, is people making judgments over things they haven't even seen. Um, and it became even a, a more obvious situation with the murals because they were covered, and yet people felt they were controversial in some way. I mean, it was the, ma I mean, the dance of seven veils where the person was wearing 14 veils. Um, because now that they're uncovered and uh, people have had a chance to go up and see them, I think it is interesting because a lot of the intensity with the discussion that surrounded it has uh, leveled off somewhat. I mean, they're hardly controversial murals. I mean, I'm not sure how many of you have ever been to this wonderful private museum in Pennsylvania called the Barnes Collection. But at the Barnes Collection, Dr. Barnes, who was kind of a brilliant guy, commissioned the great French artist Matisse to make his only mural in America. And so there's a great Matisse mural located in the Barnes Collection. And Matisse was very involved in this project. It's one of the great works of art, single works of art that's in America. Utterly unknown because they don't publish their collection. But in any event, there it is. It's basically Michael Spafford took the scale, the format, the attitude of the Matisse mural and translated. His work is, is a Matisse paper cutout, some of the most celebrated of Matisse's works, some of the most beautiful and simple abstractions of the 20th century which have strong representational references. It's a very simple, beautiful thing. It has to exist inside a building which is so ornate, so gaudy, so architecturally tasteless in certain ways that you just can't believe it. I mean, it's in the, in it's, it's hard for that work to adjust to that spot. But in many ways, the spot should adjust to the work, because it's a very admirable, authentic thing in a, in a building which is majestic and grand, but you could be in Idaho, you could be in Alabama, you could be in any state, because it's the ubiquitous state capitol building. It has no sense of distinction, no regional power, no, no quality to make you feel as if you're um, in some kind of a special place, other than its very luxuriant materials. And so the authenticity, the sense of uh, an individual hand touching that building gives the building something quite poignant. The, the tension, the torsion that exists between that mural and the building is an intense one, but I think it's a very engaging and, and fascinating one. And one only hopes that people will leave well enough, good enough, alone. Obviously, we could hear more, but it is time for us to close. Please join me in thanking Patterson Sims for a most stimulating talk. Please don't forget the surveys, and we are adjourned. Thank you.